Our scripture reading today comes to us from the first chapter of the Gospel of John. John the Baptist has, uh, just the day before, baptized Jesus and announced that he was indeed the Messiah. And then the Gospel for today begins. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. And turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? And they said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is, the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which when translated is Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. And finding Philip, he said to him, follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethsaida. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of God. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. When Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said to him, Here truly is an Israelite in whom there is no deceit. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. And Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. And Jesus said, you believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than that. And then he added, very truly, I tell you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. The season of Epiphany is the season of light. It's all about light coming into the world and overcoming the darkness. Last week, we heard about three uh, wise men who saw a speck of light in the sky that no one else noticed, but that light was enough to lead them to the greatest journey of their lives and the privilege of standing before the very Son of God and worshiping Him. Today, our scripture focuses on coming into the light in such a way that we begin to see who Jesus actually is. Jesus came to John the Baptist who was out baptizing people at the Jordan and John's first reaction is, you should be baptizing me. But Jesus said, no, let it be done as it is written. And so John baptizes Jesus. And when he does, the spirit descends upon him in a dove and a voice speaks from heaven. This is my son, my beloved. Listen to him. And the very next day, John sends two of his disciples to follow Jesus. Now, John himself does not become a disciple of Jesus because God has given him other work to do. His work is to prepare the way for the Messiah, not to actually follow the Messiah. And so he continues his work, but he sends some of his disciples to follow the one whom he has called the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The scripture tells us that one of these two disciples of John who follow Jesus is a man named Andrew. We're not told who the other disciple was, but we believe that it was the gospel writer, John himself. And so they 
follow Jesus, and about four o'clock in the afternoon, Jesus turns around and says, what do you seek? Why are you following me? Who are you anyway? And they say to him, Master, where are you staying? Come and see, Jesus says. And then we're told that they spend the day with him. Now that throws us uh, folks who are using the uh, today's time clock out of whack because it says it was 4 o'clock in the afternoon. It says they spent the day with him. The day in Jewish parlance begins at 6 o'clock in the afternoon, which means that they spent the night with Jesus wherever it was that he was saying. So we need to go back to that very first thing that Jesus says to them. What do you seek? Who are you? Why are you following me? They may have been Pharisees, of course, who were following Jesus. We know that the Pharisees followed him wherever he went. In the early days of his ministry, the Pharisees believed that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. They sent John, they sent Zebedee. I'll get it right in a minute. They sent Nicodemus to see Jesus, and, and he said to them in the very beginning of his ministry, we know that you are a man come from God. No one could do the things that you do unless he came from God. So Andrew and the other disciple may have been Pharisees. Now Pharisees, whenever they wanted to talk with Jesus, wanted to talk about theology. They wanted to talk about God. They wanted to talk about the law. Because they realized that Jesus had a different approach. Jesus would say, you have heard it said that, or you have seen that it's written that, but I say to you something else. And so Jesus took the law and, and changed it and, and made it bolder and even stronger. And so whenever the Pharisees sit down with Jesus, they want to talk with him about God. They want to talk with him about his understanding of God. They want to talk with him about the law as they understand it and as he understands it. And so when Jesus asked them, what do you seek? He may have thought, well, these are Pharisees who want to talk about God. Now, there are a lot of modern day Pharisees too. There are a lot of us who want to know more about God. There are a lot of us who follow Jesus so that we can get our questions answered. There are a lot of us who have deep, deep-seated questions that we need answering, and we're hoping, we're hoping that Jesus will give us the answers. Or Andrew and the other disciple may have been Sadducees. The Sadducees were the ruling class of Judaism. They were the, the aristocracy and a very important and powerful group of people. And they may have been Sadducees who were following Jesus to see if maybe Jesus could improve their positions of power. And there are a lot of people like that today. There are a lot of people who want to follow Jesus because they want to be closer to God. They want to have a more important position and more power within the community of faith. And there's nothing wrong with that. Andrew and the other disciple may have been Sadducees who wanted to move up into the positions of importance so that they could serve God more faithfully. We know that was true of James and John later on. They asked for positions of Secretary of State and Vice President in the New Kingdom. Jesus said, oh, you may want to be careful what you ask for. Maybe they were zealots. Why are you following me? What do you seek? There were, there were a number of the disciples who were zealots. One of them is called Simon the Zealot. The zealots were the original terrorist. Long before there was a Palestinian liberation organization that did terrorism, there was the Jewish liberation terrorists. They called themselves zealots. And they terrorized the Romans. They wanted to get rid of those horrible Romans, those Romans who were forcing their law upon them and also their taxes. The zealots hated the Romans and wanted the Jewish nation to rise above Roman power. 
And so they may have been zealots who were hoping that Jesus would be the military Messiah, the one that they had been waiting for who would be the great king who would set them free from their bondage. Well, they may have been simple, humble men of prayer. Andrew and this other disciple who had been following John the Baptist may have been men who just wanted to know God better. That they didn't have a political agenda. They didn't have a theological agenda. They didn't have a military agenda. They just wanted to know God. What do you seek? They may have been men who, like a lot of us, were simply puzzled, couldn't understand all the troubles and trials and heartaches of life, and we're just looking for answers. They may have been like so many of us who come week after week after week, hoping through our acts of worship and adoration and praise that we might just somehow come to know God better. And so they ask him, where are you staying? Now, we don't get the answer to the question where you're staying. Jesus may have been staying with a Pharisee. He may have been staying with a Sadducee. He may have been staying with a Zealot. We don't know where Jesus was staying. We don't know who he was staying with, but whoever it was, it told them a lot about who he was. And so Jesus answers the question very simply, come and see. Have you ever had any come and see moments? I remember one in my life. It was the day my ch first child was born. He was, without a doubt, the single most beautiful baby ever born in the history of the world. He was just beautiful. He had flaming red hair and the most beautiful blue eyes, and he was just gorgeous. Fortunately, he looked like his mother. Now, if you don't believe me that he was the most beautiful child ever, you can ask Phyllis, and I'm sure she would agree with you. I remember calling my mother and saying, of course, she knew that the baby was coming, but I remember saying, Mom, you've got to come and see. You've got to come and see. He's the most beautiful baby ever. I could hear my mother smiling over the phone. And when she saw him, she knew I was right. <laughs> there are some beautiful babies, and then there are the rest of us. I was not a pretty baby. In fact, my mother told me so. <laughs> when your mother says you were not an attractive baby, that means you were really ugly. There's only one picture of me as a baby, and Mom tried to destroy that one. Uh, fortunately, my child took after his mother, and we're thankful and grateful for that. Have you had any come-and-see moments? Have you had those moments when you wanted everyone to come and see what you had seen? Come and see. And that's what happens the very next morning after Andrew and the other disciples spent the night with Christ. Andrew goes and finds his brother Simon. Come and see, he says. We have found the Messiah. And so Andrew drags his brother Simon to see Jesus. And Jesus calls him Peter, the rock, the one upon whom the whole church will be built, not Jesus is the one who builds the church, but it's the faith of Simon who makes the church strong and holds it together. Come and see. Have you had any come and see moments in your life? The next day, Jesus decides he's going to go to Galilee, and before he goes, he, he goes and calls a man named Philip. Philip, I want you to follow me. Philip also was from the same town as Andrew and Peter and James and John, the town of Beth Bethsaida or Bethesda. And Philip 
decides that he will indeed follow Jesus as well. But before he is willing to follow, he says, I've got somebody I need to go and call. And so Philip goes and finds a man named Nathaniel. We have found the Messiah. He is Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And Nathaniel does not say, oh, isn't it great? Nathaniel says, Nazareth? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? I grew up in Rocky Mountain, North Carolina. The next town that is closest by is Wilson. And everyone from Rocky Mountain knows that nothing good can come from Wilson. <laughs> and everyone from Wilson knows that nothing good can come from Rocky Mountain. The two towns are almost identically the same size, and they're only 18 miles apart, and they are constantly kind of battling with one another. When I was a child, it was the great honor of being called the world's largest tobacco market. Wilson would win one year by 100 pounds, and Rocky Mount would win by the next year by maybe 40 pounds. But they were back and forth and back and forth over this great honor of having sold the most tobacco in the world. It was a fascinating place in which to grow up. We knew that nothing good came from Wilson, and we wouldn't have anything to do with anybody who came from Wilson. The two high schools, of course, were bitter enemies. But then we got driver's licenses. And we discovered that there were girls in Wilson. <laughs> Maybe, maybe it wasn't true that nothing good comes from Wilson. We uh, found ourselves going to a grill in Wilson where Wilson girls hung around. And we later discovered that there were Wilson boys who drove to a grill in Rocky Mount. <laughs> nothing good can come from Nazareth. But interestingly enough, Bethsaida is only seven miles from Nazareth. Nathaniel has this prejudice against his nearby town. We're not sure why, but he announces boldly, nothing good can come from Nazareth. But Philip says, come and see. Come and see. If you will just come and see, and so he some, maybe he has to drag Nathaniel. We're not sure, but somehow he gets Nathaniel to come. And while Nathaniel is approaching Jesus, Jesus, before he is even introduced, says to him, Behold, an Israelite in whom there is no guile, a man of God in whom there is no deceit. Hmm. Nathaniel, I can see him just putting his hand on his hips and saying, How do you know me? Well, because I saw you under the fig tree. What? Under the fig tree? My grandfather had a fig tree that covered almost half of his backyard. It was the most wonderful place for little boys to hide. Fig tree leaves, as you know, are huge. They're huge. That's why Adam and Eve used those. You know, they helped to cover things. And... Uh, Fig trees, because of the leaves, they, they make this huge canopy. Now, under the fig trees, little boys don't mind it, but anybody with any sense would mind it. Under the fig tree, there are two things, rotting figs and bird droppings. <laughs> By the ton. Rotting figs and bird do. Ugh. I didn't mind it too much as a little boy, but I don't think I'd like it much as an adult. And Jews had understood that fig trees had this unique underneath. And so the Jews had developed a very, very significant and very specialized way in which one could come into relationship with God. If you'd done everything you were supposed to do, if you'd paid all the tithes you were supposed to pay, if you'd prayed all the prayers you were supposed to pray, if you'd been to all the worship services you were supposed to go to and you still couldn't find God, you would very surreptitiously, without a single person knowing, you would crawl under a fig tree and meditate upon the Word 
and there God would come to you. We don't know when Nathaniel had made this journey of faith, but he had not let anyone know. So when Jesus said to him, I saw you under the fig tree, Nathaniel knew that he had to be the Son of God. And so Nathaniel, so Jesus says to him, I saw you under the tree, and Nathaniel says, You are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. And Jesus is a little stunned. Jesus says, You believe because I saw said I saw you under the fig tree? You had not seen anything yet. You're going to see angels ascending and descending from the throne of God. Wow. Come and see. Come and see. And that confirmed for Nathaniel even more powerfully than the statement that Jesus had made. Because clearly, of all the passages of the Old Testament, the one that Nathaniel had chosen to meditate on was the one about Jacob. Jacob, who had stolen the birthright from his brother Esau. Jacob, who had run away in fear. Jacob, who had spent a lifetime running from God for fear of retribution. Jacob, who had run so long that when he finally decided to lie down, was willing to use a rock for a pillow. Jacob, who went to sleep, and in his sleep saw the heavens opened with a ladder and angels ascending and descending from the throne of God. Of all the passages in the Old Testament, that's the one he picked. And that's the one Jesus said, you too shall be like Jacob if you will just come and see. Have you had any come and see moments? Have you had any of those moments where you have seen, where the light has shone, where the darkness has been dispelled, where your eyes have been opened, where your heart has been warmed, where your soul has been changed. And the only thing you can do in response is to call someone and say, come, come and see. That is what the light is all about. Each one of us must have those, one of those come and see moments. And we may be blessed to have many of them in our lives. Those moments like when you first went over a hill and saw the mountains and wanted everyone else to come and see. Or that moment like when you went around the curve in the road and saw for the very first time the ocean. And you want everyone else to come and see. Or one of those moments like when you held your child the most beautiful baby ever born, and you wanted everyone else to come and see. Or one of those moments when the light shone on you and you knew that you were loved, forgiven, graced, empowered, touched, saved, made whole, healed, that you knew that you too were a child of God simply because you came and saw. So what do you expect God to do for you? Well, mostly we just want to know where he is so that we too can come and see. Amen.